do you do if you've got experimental medicine that you need to test, or you are trying to figure out the exact nature and the effects of a mysterious disease? But you can't test it on humans, and mice and other animal models are just not close enough to human structures. And computer simulators just won't cut it. In the 21st century, we have a new tool to attack this problem. They are called organoids, tiny collections of cells that grow in the lab, beginning with human stem cells. When I say tiny, I mean you can put one organoid on the head of a pin. It's only got a fraction of numbers of cells of actual organ has. But an organoid closely mimics the development and the reactions of an actual human organ in the live human body, like a brain, a liver, or a kidney. So you can run experiments on these organoids. There is no ethical dilemma. And there is a direct correlation of how a disease develops or how a pharmaceutical might work in the actual human organ and how it works in organoids. So think of organoids as a biological simulator that is more than halfway to the real thing. They self-organize, they perform self-sorting, and their functionality closely parallels the real organ where the original tissue come from. Last year, organoids proved their power for biomedical research in a very dramatic way, and I'll tell you the story. In 2015, the news media around the world was sounding the alarm about Zika virus, and people had begun to fear that was connected to a rise of numbers of babies born with microcephaly. As you know, microcephaly is when a baby is born with abnormally small head and brain. This infant often endure moderate to severe chronic developmental conditions and chronic conditions that often require lifelong medical attention. Microcephaly can also lead to early death. Zika virus is very different from other viruses. It was originally identified almost 70 years ago in the Zika forest in Uganda. But until our time, it has never been associated with developmental or neurological problems. So it's a known virus, but not well publicized. Apparently, this virus has suddenly evolved to affect new organs and systems, thus putting different population of people at risk. What is even more worrisome is that people infected with the virus were often asymptomatic, but still infectious via bodily fluids. So pregnant women in the affected regions of the world were understandably alarmed. Mosquito-borne viruses are difficult to protect against. And there's startling stories, images, and statistics in the news to show that babies born with microcephaly. So this wasn't just rumors or scaremongering. It was real. In the regions where the Zika virus transmission was active, the number of cases of microcephaly was surging. So the World Health Organization decided to blow the whistle. On February 1st, 2016, the WHO declared an international public health emergency of international concern. So what is clearly needed here is the data linking the Zika virus to microcephaly. Was the sudden increase of microcephaly cases really caused by the Zika virus? Or was it something else? Maybe something in their environment? If Zika was the culprit, how does it only cause damages in babies, but not in mothers? One more thing makes the Zika virus an unusual challenge. It appears to target in the developing brain, which is a problem for medical researchers because the developing nervous system is generally inaccessible for the controlled experiments that are needed to address those questions. While all of this is going on, 
my lab was about to publish a new study of generation of new 3D model of the brain development. This represented the culmination of several years of work to generate this particular model. And our new model built upon two key, two key discoveries. First, cellular reprogramming can take a cell of any tissue from an adult or a child and modify this cell to behave like an embryonic stem cell. And that modified cells can turn into any single cell types in a human body. And second, these modified cells can also be cultured in, uh, under conditions to encourage the formation of 3D structures of any tissue types. That same flexibility is there when we try to use these modified cells to generate 3D human cell cultures. We realized we need to closely simulate how the uterus support and influence the developing fetuses. This includes things such as microgravity and exposure to circulating, um, circul circulating growth factors. To mimic this environment, we decided to use a spinning bioreactor. This was a device originally designed by NASA. By growing the cells in the spinning bioreactor, it will keep the growing cells in suspension as if they were in a constant state of free fall. And by filling these bioreactors with a cocktail of growth factors and media, we could potentially test in different conditions to encourage the growth and the formation from those modified cells to form desired 3D structures. This is great. But here is where we run into a problem. The spinning bioreactor on the market required a large amount of very expensive media and supplements. And testing different combinations of conditions at the same time is simply cost prohibitive. But if we couldn't test different conditions at the same time, we would be working in the dark. It would be a guessing game to hit on the right combination. And going through all the combinations would also take a long time. So unless we learned how to grow money in the lab, we wouldn't know what the heck we're going to do. So the solution came to us from some place that we did not expect. Our summer interns, high school kids. So we had given three very talented high school kids a task of developing a miniaturized version of the marketing spinning bioreactor. Miniature as in, takes less space, requires less media, and costs less money. Each of them have learned how to use a 3D software. And together with other members in the lab, they succeeded in designing a functional miniaturized spinning bioreactor. So with this device, now we can test many different conditions at the same time, and it's affordable. So while, as you can imagine, this has greatly accelerated our progress, and by 2015, we have identified the best conditions to grow brain organoids. Trust me, this is something is of a very close to a developing brain. And this organoids also contains the right cell types that a developing human brain has. For example, we have the neural stem cells and we also have the progeny from the, uh, derived from these neural stem cells that populate the cortical layers or our cortex. And also, these organoids contain the correct cellular architecture that also very similar to a developing brain, where you can see that the stem cells are localized inside near the ventricles, and the progeny they gave rise to migrate outside to form our cortex. So when the news of Zika virus and the microcephaly hit, we realized our new, mood, new brain organoids would be a perfect model to see what's the Zika's effect 
and its connection to microcephaly, which is a neurodevelopmental disease. Well, we realized that we have another problem. We have the organoids, but we have no Zika virus, and we have no experience working with infectious viruses. Almost immediately, we thought about our long old friend, uh, Henley Tan, who is a virologist and a professor at Florida State University. We had attended the same graduate school at the same time, almost 20 years ago, at the University of California, San Diego. And we knew that Hen Li had been working on dengue virus, which is a virus carried by the same strains of mosquitoes uh, that carries Zika virus. So we thought, at the very least, Hen Li would have some information about availability of the Zika virus. As it turned out, it's even better that his lab is actually growing the Zika virus. And he's, has, he's having a complementary challenge. He had a virus, but they don't have experience with neural cells or developmental neurobiology. Although we have known each other for about, about years, for about 20 years, but we never had a chance to collaborate. We thought this is, would be the perfect chance for us. By joining forces, we could ask and potentially answer two key questions. The Zika virus infect any neural cells directly during human brain development? And is there any evidence that, to show that Zika causes microcephaly? So this sounds uh, very straightforward uh, scientifically, but in practice, was not easy. To, pre to begin with, we could not shift live Zika virus and work with it in my lab because of biosafety regulations. So we decided to do the other way around. We shipped our cells, organoids, bioreactors, and people down to Florida to work in Henley's lab. After a lot of work and planning, our people and materials arrived in Henley's lab. And a few days later, a few, uh, the, uh, the initial data was sent. We have tested several different cell types and to see what happened if they were infected with the Zika virus. As it turned out, the most vulnerable cells were the, was the neural stem cells, the mother cells of the, neuro, uh, of the developing brain. The data from our experiments were convincing and disconcerting. As neural stem cells generate all other cell types in the nervous system, that means the virus targeting these cells, this type of stem cells, would have long-lasting and widespread consequences. So now we have the answer to our first big question. Can Zika virus direct infect any neural cells in the developing human brain? Yes. We were one step closer to unraveling the mystery. For our second question, can Zika virus infection resulted in microcephaly, we were able to use our organoids for this study. Again, a few days later, the, the data was convincing and very disturbing. The organoids infected with Zika virus simply stopped growing. And the way that they stopped growing resembles those seen in microcephaly. We published our first collective data on March 4th, 2016. And two, 39 days later, this data, along with additional clinical, epidemiological, and laboratory evidences, led the Center for Disease Control announce that Zika causes microcephaly. So the speed of this announcement was unprecedented, and the ability for CDC to move that fast was even more remarkable, especially considering how little we knew about the Zika's impact on the developing brain just a few months before. We look forward to the days that our brain organoids can help us to develop better treatment for Zika. 
and help us to further our understanding of other neurological diseases, like Alzheimer's, autism, schizophrenia, and several more. We have a lot of work to do. We face medical challenges out there that will test us and require the best we've got. Our confirmation of the link between Zika virus and microcephaly was powered by many sources. Technology, of course. But what is even more important is the trust and transparency and putting science ahead of everything else. That includes money and the egos. If we want to take the limits off biomedical research, it begins by taking the limits of our thinking. A great idea can come from anywhere. An old friend in another lab, or in a, even a high school intern. We can't wait to see what challenges we're going to tackle next and what limits we're going to push through to get there. Thank you.